All right, we're rolling. I'm here with Steve Kusaba, who has a, a grand project. Do you want to tell me about it? Yes. This project is a 47-hour Omni musical, and it has some key themes in it. And one of the, uh, it's, it's about the advent of life and man, and the rights of man, and the, and the reverence toward life. And what's the name of this project? It's the Centrifugal Zotz Clock. Great clock, synchronizing bell, ring in the parts all move. True clock, mystifying tell, clue if it's dark or light. Send all the players hurrying to go, view all the layers and labyrinth below. Moving as if it's from a single thought, gears in the great Zotz Clock. Great and mighty clock, synchronizing bell. So, um, would you characterize it as a, a political work? It's very political and, and very spiritual in a sense because it examines the modern ruling structures and how they interact with people. And it mostly has sort of a message of hope where that in some place people might be able to live freely and not be so stifled by the ruling class like in North Korea, for instance. Is there anything else you'd like to say about your project? Well, there's probably a, a lot that can be said, but I think this is a pretty good start. I appreciate it. Thank you for uh, interviewing me. Oh, thank you for the interview. Okay, excellent. In accordance with the principles of doublethink, it does not matter if the war is not real, or when it is, that victory is not possible. The war is not meant to be won. It is meant to be continuous. The essential act of modern warfare is the destruction of the produce of human labor. A hierarchical society is only possible on the basis of poverty and ignorance. In principle, the war effort is always planned to keep society on the brink of starvation. 
The war is waged by the ruling group against its own subjects, and its object is not victory over Eurasia or East Asia, but to keep the very structure of society intact. Two warriors engage, their weapons flash, spill blood, splash glints of steel into the air. Such fracas, such encounters are the war of puppy love, the torment of young flesh. Dearest, our blades are broken. The fine fashion of youth is gone, but teeth and fingernails take up where the outmoded weapon fails. Hearts ulcerated by a full-fledged passion. In a deep gully, links haunted forlorn, roll on our own champions, locked in brute embrace, tearing their bloody flesh among the thorns. That is the pit of hell, filled with our kind. Let's roll in it ourselves, with no remorse, to keep alive hatred without end. talking about the song Desperate, which was built around the uh, Balkan Wars. It's the same story. It just repeats itself all over the world. It's the same exact story. You can go back to the, the kings. You can go back to the emperors, to the tyrants. You can go all through history. It's the same thing. The people have leaders. And the leaders have goals that are nearly always the opposite of what the leaders' goals are. The leaders want for themselves to get uh, lots of wealth and power and so forth. And uh, frequently you'll see them, they're always starting war somewhere. They're always getting everyone wound up through their propaganda. So they hate this group, they hate that group. Judentum stellt eine infektiöse Erscheinung dar, die ansteckend wirkt. Deutschland jedenfalls hat nicht die Absicht, sich dieser jüdischen Bedrohung zu beugen, sondern vielmehr die, ihr rechtzeitig, wenn nötig, unter vollkommener und radikalster Ausschaltung des Judentums entgegenzutreten. And the Balkan Wars were no, were no different. Ne mojte da mislite da nećete odesti Bosnu i Hercegovinu u pakao, a muslimanski narod možda u nestanak. Jer muslimanski narod ne može da se odbrani ako bude ratno. Njegovi, njegov način izlaganja, njegove poruke, možda na najbolji način objašnjavaju zašto mi 
i možda nećemo više da ostanemo u Jugoslaviji. To večeras govorim o ovdje. Kako u Jugoslaviju, kako hoće gospodin Karadžić više, niko neće. Neće više niko možda u Srpsko, osim srpskog naroda. You know, ethnic cleansing, what was this all about? It was about a thin cadre of people at the top trying to benefit from winding everybody up and destroying enormous numbers of lives. You know, children, women, men, everything, just all in motion. People... You know, in uh, Bosnia, having to thread their way through difficult journeys up mountains to get just to get food and and to try and survive, and then armies running around looking for people to kill. And, and what is it for? It's just some some narrow-minded people. You know, well, it makes sense from their perspective. They're trying to do everything that works for them. They don't care. They don't care about the, 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 the people. And the leaders are always telling the people, this other group here, those are your enemy. You need, they're, they're the ones you need to, to fight with. They're, and it's just the exact opposite. The world is covered in a crust, a thick cement crust of rulers, of leaders, who from, from North Korea to... Uh, Russia to China and every virtually every country what country doesn't have it they all do Haiti everywhere and and the western nations too it's the same thing and what you what you had was um eventually the Balkan wars uh ended and then uh, Milosevic and uh, a number of other people ended up in the dockets of uh you know, war crimes, trials. But if you look in the Western nations, the same thing's happening there. Uh, that it's not like directly war that involves the citizens. But what they're doing is, for instance, they're spending $2 for every dollar taken in taxes, they're printing $2 worth. And they're telling everybody how they need inflation, that, that, that everybody needs rising prices. But this isn't what, the peop, what people need. It's hard enough to make ends meet. All the jobs, all the manufacturing has left uh, America because of what the politicians did, because of their money printing, because of their taxation, because of their uh, regulations, and most of all because of their money printing. And... We're supposed to think some of somebody in some other country is the problem. It's never the case. Let's say China. 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 You go over to China. 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 You take China. 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 I love them. China. China. China, China, China. I have to have my China. China, China, because China, 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 China now, China, China. You know, China. I know China very well. China, 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 China. Northwest Wisconsin, where I'm from. It's China to me, China. China, 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 China. You want to buy from China? That's great. Buy from China. Buy toys from China. China in particular. China, China. I have people that I know in China. China, 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 China. I've been saying China, 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 China. Let me ask you about China. China. I go to China. 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 People from China. They love me. China. 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 In China, they say I don't like China. I love China. People think I don't like China. I love China. China. China is the new China, by the way. China. 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 I deal with China. 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 Big league. China. So don't tell me about China. I know China. 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 Whether it's China, China. So if you went to China and you wanted to get a job in China, I don't knock China. 
How can I dislike China? A man from China. China. You have China. Carl, take China. 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 China is over here. Look at what China is doing. They're learning from China. 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 Okay. Look at that. Isn't that nice? China. 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 And by the way, I love China. I mean, I love China. How can you not love China? I love China. 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 And you know China, 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 South China, China, China. People say, oh, you don't like China. I like China. China. I love China. China. China all the time. China. What was the last time you heard China? It's never the case. Okay. The, okay. The, the, the problems that every country has is due to their rulers. No, I don't take responsibility at all. And it's interesting that corporate media will always explain things in such a way that covers up for those leaders and doesn't tell people the truth. They'll actually sit there and tell them, we need another round of stimulus. But go analyze PPP and go analyze where the money goes. Where does the money go? It's being given to billionaires. It's being given to corporations. It's being given to donors. It's, begin, it's, begin, it's given to all of these people. And who's going to pay it? The poor and middle class are going to pay it because they're going to get the, the regular inflation that somehow these knotheads, you know, think that, oh, that we all need. I mean, sure, we, we just really need the cost of everything going up. You know, they need the cost of everything going up because printing money is how they steal. And the enemies of everyone in the world are their own rulers. And if you, arri if you arrived at a place where they had something close to what the Founding Fathers did in America, you know, with removing some of the imperfections that were in that first setup, where people were, you know, where the liberties of individual men were what was important, the rule of law, that is, real law, not code, no victim, no crime, and then most of all, government never doing anything that isn't, ex isn't expressly written in the Constitution. And if you, you, you had that all around the world, where all of a sudden the world was just freed from these crust of parasites, like giant leeches, sucking off of every single individual, the world would have a renaissance like no, that no one could ever imagine. It would be uh, magnificent. It would, be, it would open the way for all kinds of innovation, for all kinds of freedom. For, and people would uh, benefit in, in a compound way because things like that have a way of creating their own waves of positive outcomes. So, you know, the Balkan Wars, just more of the same. Same as the pogroms, same as, you know, every, every single ridiculous thing that's ever gone on. Militar, militaristic Japan going through Asia, you know, the Nazis trying to own the world, the Soviet Union trying to own the world. It's, it's all the same stuff. It's just the same thing. You just have to understand it. It's just very clear. The rulers are always the problem. And will always be. Till a majority of people can understand that. And then the ones in the democratic countries can simply vote for liberties and freedom. And, and to have an actual republic. Which would set an example, I'm sure, that would, st would slowly topple all of the other rot hole places. Eventually it would just be like dominoes. So let's hope that happens. Like a centrifugal Zotz clock moment when everybody wakes up and just says, hey, we can fix this ourselves. 
Possession of Bosnia-Herzegovina traded back and forth for centuries. In 1908, the country was annexed by Austria-Hungary. In 1918, following the dissolution of Austria-Hungary, Bosnia joined five other socialist territories to form Yugoslavia. This remained the status quo until the early 1990s. At that point, Slovenia, Croatia and Macedonia each successively voted to leave Yugoslavia, and this led to war in many of those regions. At that point in Bosnia, three main ethnic groups formed the population. Almost half were Slavic Muslim Bosniaks, while Orthodox Christian Serbs comprised just over 30% and Catholic Croats were 17% of the populace. Serb nationalists within Bosnia were strongly against the idea of their country's independence. At the end of February 1992, when Bosnia voted in a referendum on the subject, Serbs boycotted the vote in favor of creating their own republic called the Serbian Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina. However, those who did vote chose to secede from Yugoslavia, and so the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina was declared at the beginning of March 1992. Within a month, the newly created country was attacked by Serbian forces, with support from Slobodan Milosevic's Serbian government and the Yugoslav People's Army. We are not supporting any military action in Bosnia and Herzegovina. We were not provoking or supporting hostility. Aside from the desire to claim new territory for Greater Serbia, the Serbs wanted to ethnically cleanse the population of Muslims. Initially, Croats and Bosniaks stood up in the face of this Serb threat. The infamous siege of Sarajevo began early in the war, in April 1992, when Serb forces took the predominantly Muslim capital city. This four-year siege resulted in the deaths or disappearances of roughly 10,000 people from the city, including many children. As residents scrambled for basic human needs, they were also required to evade sniper fire while in the streets. 1992 also marked the start of the genocide against the non-Serbian populations of Bosnia. Those groups were intimidated, tortured and killed, with villages and homes destroyed. Targeted groups became refugees or were held in detention camps. By the end of the year, the Serbs occupied roughly 70% of the country. Croat forces had also shifted from a defensive stance and began seizing land. The damage a war, referred to as the Croat-Bosnia War, that battle overshadowed much of 1993. That year, the UN sent aid to Bosnia, but was criticized for being largely ineffectual in the face of this conflict. By 1994, NATO intervened by launching airstrikes against the Serbs. While this succeeded in ending some sieges, fighting continued. When the Croat-Bosniak War ended that year, those groups re-teamed to fight the Serbs together. As conflict continued into 1995, one of the most violent crimes on European soil since the Second World War took place. In July, the town of Srebrenica was massacred by the Bosnian Serb army, despite being a UN safe zone. Over 8,000 were killed and more were wounded and displaced. However, this was one of many similar massacres that year. NATO forces again used airstrikes against the Serbs, which helped Bosnian government forces reclaim lost territory. The end of hostilities came soon after. We have family of Bina, Odvedena Logor, Omarska Trnopolje. Ni, nema tragova da su živi. Međutim, jedan stric iz starog Majdana, on je doveden ovdje u Sasinu i ubijen. Sin od drugog strica, on je na jedan zvjerski način i to od svoga komšije ubijen. Vezan je na traktor lancima i vučen je po, mi kažemo čaršija, po trgu. Jer muslimanski narod ne može da se odbrani ako bude rat ovdje. The Srebrenica genocide stands as one of the worst episodes of ethnic cleansing in Europe after the Second World War. Over five days, 8,000 unarmed Bosnian Muslim men and boys were massacred by the Bosnian Serb military forces, while thousands of women were raped. But the story of the mass murders and persecution of Bosnian Muslims does not begin here. 
the breakup of Yugoslavia, military conflict quickly erupted, first in Slovenia and Croatia, and finally Bosnia. And while there were losses on all fronts, Bosnian Muslims seemed to pay the highest price. Only a month after the Bosnian Declaration of Independence in March 1992, a Serbia-based paramilitary group attacked the city of Bjelina, slaughtering between 48 and 78 non-Serb civilians in a single day. This was the beginning of what would become four years of killing, persecution and rape. Soon after, other towns along the Serbian border started to share the same fate. Between May and August 1992, in the city of Prijedor, over 3,100 non-Serb civilians were massacred, the majority of them Muslims. When the massacres began in other cities on the border with Serbia, it was clear that the aim was to ethnically cleanse the region from the Muslim population. In the city of Visegrad, between April and August of the same year, another 3,000 Bosnian Muslims were killed, 70 of them locked up and burned alive in a local house. Concentration camps began to appear. A hotel near the city was used as a brothel camp, where women and girls as young as seven were continuously raped, some for over eight months. By the end of 1992, there were close to another 3,000 victims in the cities of Zvornik, Vlasenica and Tuzla. The massacres that happened in the city of Pocha, with 2,074 Muslim victims, paved the way to what was to eventually take place in Srebrenica in 1995. The UN safe zone of Srebrenica, where over 8,300 people were murdered, was the last city of eastern Bosnia from which the Muslim population was purged. Along with the Markala massacres in Sarajevo, they became the two main reasons that the international forces stepped in and began the peace process. By the end of the war, over 64,000 Bosnian Muslims were killed, half of them civilians. Around 50,000 women and girls were raped. Thousands were forced to leave their homes, the majority of whom never returned. The last population census from 2013 showed that the Muslim population in the eastern and northern part of Bosnia had decreased between 50 to 100 percent. The peace treaty signed in Dayton in 1995 ended the war, but also created the Republika Srpska, whose borders were drawn around the mass murders. The Srebrenica massacre was ruled as genocide by the International Court of Justice, but the other slaughters of the Muslim population in Bosnia haven't been classified the same. Many of those who committed or were directly involved in the murders and rapes of Bosnian Muslims have not yet been prosecuted, and Bosnian Muslims say there is still no justice. To that moment in court making global headlines tonight, a convicted war criminal suddenly drinking poison and then shouting a message to the judge. Here's ABC's Ian Panel. Standing silent. This Hague judge telling Slobodan Praljak his 20-year sentence for war crimes during the Bosnian War would be upheld. Mr. Praljak, you may be seated. His response, shocking. Stop, please. The 72-year-old lifting a small brown bottle to his lips, swallowing poison for all the world to see, before saying calmly to the courtroom, I have taken poison. We suspend, please, the curtains. Attempts to save Praljak failed. He was convicted for his role in a campaign to drive Muslims out of Bosnia and create an ethnically pure Croat state during the Bosnian War in the 90s. A hundred thousand died and more than two million displaced during the three-year war. I was in uh, Hamilton three years ago in the same room. This was just in the wake of the war in Yugoslavia. And as you recall, uh, many people, including people in progressive organizations, supported that war. In part, I think it had to do with a lack of understanding, but again, we, we, we were caught up in what, was, what we thought was a humanitarian war to liberate the the Kosovars from the dictatorship of, uh, of uh, Slobodan Milosevic. But I think when we 
look at the history of this entire period starting in fact starting in the early 90s we understand that this is part of a war agenda and there are several stages in this war agenda certainly Yugoslavia was one stage and Yugoslavia was very important as a step stone into this particular into the Afghan as well as into the Iraqi war for political geopolitical economic strategic regions uh, reasons we know also that the Balkans is is a is an important corridor for pipelines uh, for transportation it is the gateway into the Middle East but if you if you look at national security documents you realize that all these wars are part of the same they're part of the same design they're part of the same uh, uh, they, they emanate from the same military doctrine He's took one in the chest It almost tore his heart out Got saved by metal vest We've been ducking hand grenades From since I'll ever know Fire me up an SOS Connect me to the phone Cause we're desperate Give us a life preserver We can catch close to the bone Let's just not get put upon And left here all alone
I thought that the song Guernica would not only reflect the massacre at Guernica, which uh, during the uh, Spanish uh, Civil War uh, was carried out by their allies, um, the, the, uh, the Germans, uh, and it was a tremendously horrific uh, uh, bombing and, and attack of civilian populaces. And throughout history, um, that, that tended to be frowned upon. Franco wanted to save Spain from Marxism, the left-wing Republicans. And for this cause, he was willing to shoot half the country. Viva la muerte! With the Nazis Luftwaffe and the Italian fascists by his side, he attacked the vast town of Guernica. This town was seen as the northern home base of the Republican resistance. On the 26th of April, 1937, in the end of the afternoon around 4 o'clock, Guernica was overrun with a three-hour-long bombing by German and Italian planes. Over 3,000 bombs were dropped on the defenseless town, turning it into an inverno. The citizens were unable to escape, since the roads and bridges were destroyed first, and every moving person was shot with machine guns. That day, 1,645 people died, and thousands were terribly wounded. Most of the victims were women and children, since the men were away fighting for the Republican army. This brutal terrorist attack was clearly a threatening message to the rest of Spain. Um, you know, in World War One, when when the Germans unleashed uh, bombing blimps onto London, uh, the everyone was appalled at such a disastrous war crime. But. By the time uh, we, the, you know, we were engaged in the uh, airstrikes against Nazi Germany, uh, the bombing of civilian populations was pretty much commonplace and was expected. The bombing of Germany has long been an affair of day and night attacks, but now with the Germans beaten back within their own frontiers, that bombing has become more intensive and more inescapable than ever. These formations, flying forts of the 8th American Army Air Force, are on their way to Dresden. Their mission was a follow-up of the night attack just previously delivered by the RAF. The attacks on Dresden, in fact, were notable feats of cooperation, not only between the Anglo-American Air Forces, but also between them and their comrades of the Red Army, which was at this moment only 50 miles beyond Dresden to the east. The Americans approaching the city found fires still burning from the RAF's night attack, with 500 pounders and with incendiaries, in the face of considerable flak and in spite of cloud, they now added fuel to the flames and yet more destruction to the chaos already caused. Air Force went to Dresden on the night of the 13th, 14th of February, their force consisted of more than 800 Lancasters and other heavy bombers. 
The attack was made in two waves, the first wave bombing through cloud by instruments. When the second wave came in, the cloud had moved away and our crew saw quite clearly how accurate the work of the first wave had been. Fires were still raging, there was a lot of smoke, but as HE and incendiaries went down, old fires blazed brighter still and new fires started up. It was during this attack that the Germans sent up a new kind of scarecrow, a device that makes a big burst in the air and is supposed to look like an aircraft blowing up after being hit by flak. The Hun is ingenious, but never a very good psychologist. The Russians must certainly have had quite a good view of the RAF attacks, for our own crews reported that on their way home, Dresden's fires were clearly visible from over a hundred miles away. RAF heavy bombers assist Marshal Konyev's drive into the Reich. The target is Dresden. It was being used to pump German troops into counterattacks against the Russian army not many miles to the east. This strike put a stop to that. The night sky is pitted with aircraft, very colored target markers, and the newest German ack act device, a scarecrow designed to burst and look like a plane exploding after a direct hit. Static electrical discharge caused by intense cold mars these magnificent bombing shots. day after the RAF strike at Dresden, B-17 bombers of the 8th United States Air Force gave the city a repeat performance. After these attacks, the German overseas news agency said, this city, hitherto almost untouched, has been carpeted by heavy and super heavy high explosives and incendiaries. Dresden is a heap of ruins. It has been smashed to atoms. Before these attacks, Dresden was planned as a substitute capital in place of Berlin. After this, Hitler will have to look for a substitute for the substitute. Uh, and, and if you take, for example, Japan, uh, we firebombed every major city in Japan. Uh, until there was nothing left and after we had done all of that we dropped two nuclear weapons on um, non-military targets. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941 left the United States reeling in the Pacific. The U.S. military lacked the capacity to bring the war to Japan in a sustained way. The B-29, the Superfort, with 2,200 horsepower in each of four engines, with a fuel capacity equal to that of a railroad tank car, a tail that climbed two stories into the air, a body longer than a Corvette, designed to carry more destruction and carry it higher, faster, farther than any bomber ever built before. And to complete this mission, that's exactly what she was going to have to do. Better be good, fella. Here goes a million bucks on the wing. By late 1944, the United States had advanced far enough that the new U.S. bomber, the B-29, could reach Tokyo on a regular basis. This was the takeoff for one of the greatest mass flights in history. Three hundred and twenty one miles westward to Matherfield, California. The first U.S. bombing raids did minor damage, so U.S. bomber pilots developed new tactics. They flew low in at night. They also began to use incendiary bombs against Japanese. Mather Field was their POAE, Port of Aerial Embarkation. From Mather Field to Pearl Harbor, 2,415 miles further west. 334 B-29s dropped 2,000 tons of bombs. The 
The attack unleashed a rare firestorm that fed on itself. Temperatures reached an estimated 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 square miles in Tokyo, equivalent to half of Manhattan, were burned out. In an office on that same field, a new bomber command was being born. The 21st, Brigadier General Haywood Hansel commanding, to include all the planes and all the crews that had left Nebraska. After briefing next morning, General Hansel and the men left Hawaii. Their final base was no longer a mystery. 4,000 miles farther west, with only one refueling stop on the way, lay the island of Saipan. Less than four months before, it had still been in the hands of the Japanese. That was something for the men to think about. It was for them that the Battle of Saipan was fought, for a base big enough to hold their B-29s. Soldiers, sailors, and Marines paid a price for that base. Realizing it made every man anxious to get there, to make Saipan pay off. No one knows for sure how many people died in the firebombing of Tokyo. The estimates range from 90,000 to well more than 100,000. That is a death toll equal to, if not higher, than the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The bombings didn't stop at Tokyo. They continued for the next five months until Japan surrendered in the wake of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Some one million Japanese died, the mass majority because of conventional bombing attacks. Well, the, the first element of the 21st Bomber Command has arrived. When we've done some more fighting, we'll do some more talking. Thank you. Our target for today is one of three of the Nakajima aircraft plants located 11 miles west of Tokyo. The men had hoped the first one would be Tokyo, and they were delighted. What is the lesson of the firebombing of Tokyo? Just this. The danger of nuclear weapons should not blind us to the destructive power of conventional weapons. The Rwandan genocide of 1994 killed more than half a million people. Many of the victims died in machete attacks. An estimated 100,000 people have died in the violence that has rocked Iraq since the U.S. invasion in 2003. The death toll from war often reaches far beyond the battle. The fighting that has raged in the Eastern Congo since 1998 has killed an estimated 6 million people. Many of the victims died of malnutrition and disease, problems that can become rampant. The destructive power of conventional weapons is also the reason why countries have a responsibility to protect civilian populations where they can. feeling of being the first, the advance guard of a long procession of super forts that would smash Tokyo. There was the grim satisfaction of making the Nipponese High Command eat its words.
six hours later, through the clouds, they saw it. Fujiyama, ancient symbol of Japan. Here come some modern symbols. Phosphorus bombs and flak. And fighters. Inside a superfort, you can't see its guns. You fire by remote control. But the guns are there. And now, below them, is Tokyo. Within a radius of 15 miles of the Imperial Palace live 7 million Japanese. A people we used to think of as small, dainty, polite, concerning themselves only with floral arrangements and rock gardens and the cultivation of silkworms. But it isn't silkworms and it isn't imperial palaces these men are looking for. In the suburbs of Tokyo is the huge Nakajima aircraft plant. Well, bud, what are you waiting for? <laughs> empire is now out of our range. No war factory too remote to feel our bomb. The battle for Japan is now underway with full speed ahead. in Japan and Okinawa, B-29s prepare for an historic mission. For the first time in history, the superforts, each carrying 40 500-pound bombs, will attack enemy troops instead of strategic targets behind the front. Warner Pathé news cameraman Gene Zanier flies along to record the strike, the most concentrated bombing of enemy troops since D-Day in Normandy. The position is checked and double-checked by pilot and bombardier, for U.S. troops are within close range of the target. Four enemy divisions massed along the key Naktong River near Tegu. In ten plane formations, at ten minute intervals, the superforts release their bombs. The raid continues for 90 minutes. 900 tons of bombs rain down on a 20 square mile area before the bombardier signals, mission accomplished. Elsewhere over Korea, Air Force and Navy fighters swoop down on red troops and supplies. Under this air umbrella, the GIs attack on the ground. When it's over, General Walker can announce, Tegu is certainly safe. Advanced Headquarters, 5th Air Force, 25 July 1950. 
The Army has requested that we strafe all civilian parties that are approaching our positions. To date, we have complied with the Army request. Eighth Army Headquarters, Secret, 3 January 1951. You have complete authority in your zone to stop all civilian traffic. Responsibility to place fire on them to include bombing rests with you. Headquarters, 25th Infantry Division, 26 July 1950. General Keene directed that all civilians moving around in the combat zone will be considered as unfriendly and shot. Kids, there was kids out there, it didn't matter what it was. 880, blind, crippled, or crazy, they shot them. It just seemed like all Koreans were the enemy. We were just shooting openly. We, we didn't aim at somebody, we just, just pointing our rifles and shooting. And in that 10 minutes that it went on, that was, that was a nightmare in itself. Yeah, the guilt's the guilt's still still with me. I, I can't I can't get rid of the guilt. I can't find peace of mind. Absolution it's not there. I remember seeing this woman on her hands and knees. She was crawling. You could just see the bullets are bouncing. Tracer bullets bouncing around her. She kept crawling, crawling. Finally, I guess, you know, she would just hit, and that was it, and she just stopped, just, just like that. One sun is burning in a big flame. Yankees dropped numerous bombs on this cultural and holiday center, noted for beautiful landscape in the East Coast, even on this small holiday inn. They poured tens of thousands of bombs and naval gunfire in the coastal cities and towns of North Korea on the only ground that they were inhabited by Koreans. The U.S. bombs, napalms and incendiaries trapped all through the northern half of Korea from Hezu in the south to Kanye here in the north. Burchett, an Australian correspondent who witnessed the U.S. bombing here, wrote, No country has ever been such happily and savagely destroyed as the DPRK in history, for it was an all-out overall destruction of everything. 85% of the U.S. Air Force active in the Korean War was engaged in air raids on the Korean rear civilian targets. Nampo. The U.S. warplanes threw thousands of napalm and poison gas bombs on the port city of Nampo on the west coast. The number of napalms they dropped on North Korea in the first one year and a half of the war amounted to five times as much they had used during the Second World War. The 
Small towns in provinces, rural and coastal villages and remote mountain settlements could never escape their indiscriminate bombing campaigns. Peasants were no exception. Houses that built after liberation and the cars they reared were the targets of the U.S.'s merciless air attacks. Three hundred and seventy one thousand hectares of farmland was set. 109,000 heads of drought capital killed, and a great deal of irrigation facilities and structures crushed, all of which were far from military targets. Program Reservoir was destroyed by U.S. air attacks. They blocked numerous reservoirs to drown all farmlands, villages, and their settlers around. Six hundred and five thousand houses were blown up or swept away by the U.S. bombings during the three years of Korean War. The U.S. war planes trapped homeless people, leveled guns at the children toddling along outdoor corridors, and hunted French mothers searching for shelters to protect their babies. This is what the United States claims a campaign for the freedom of mankind. The U.S. troops were men slaughtered, human batches, who killed innocent school children and peasants in an ecstasy of delight. The U.S. troops tried to destroy even the foundations of the civilian industrial establishments of Korea. No sound is heard, nothing is seen in the sights of the iron wolf, steel plants, machine building and the chemical factories, except the painful and heart-rending scenes of bare chimneys. One hundred and fifteen U.S. warplanes dropped fifteen hundred bombs on this fertilizer factory alone. 
the Air Force commander of the U.S. Army in the Far East said, There are no industrial establishments left worth targeting for our bombers. What troubles the U.S. Air Force in Korea is that it has no more targets to destroy. During the three years of war, the U.S. Army blocked over 8,700 Korean factories and enterprises for civil use. They attempted to put the whole country into hell of darkness by destroying every power station and every transformer substation. Small boats on both east and west seas of Korea were also the targets of U.S. bombers. The number of air attacks in May 1952 on the railways of the northern half of Korea increased 71-fold over that of January 1951. <laughs> Killing inpatients in bed with napalm bombs against the civilian hospitals with Red Cross marks. This was what the United States called humanitarianism. The U.S. bombers dropped napalms on the civilian hospitals with the clear marks of Red Cross to kill disabled patients in bed and attack the schools with a rocket and other gunfire. Trapping with rockets and other gun firing, those schools their children's party. This was the American style of civilization and the charity. The schools where the children of workers and the peasants had studied their mother tongue to their heart's content, their nurseries were the major targets of the U.S. Air Force. Korean children who were too young and innocent to know the word war were killed here, staining them with blood and lost their cradles of happiness and joy. Even a seat swing in front of a nursery trembles with burning hatred for the United States, and even a homeless doll accused the U.S. men's slaughters of their atrocities. <laughs> Yankees blasted out 7,775 scientific and cultural institutions and cultural institutions and cultural heritages including Lyongwang Pavilion of Pyongyang, Taeksang Pavilion of Anzu, and those cultural and historical remains even in the remote mountain areas. The apostles of God from the United States blew up every church in Korea to the last.
아메리카 원주민들의 시체를 밟고 서산한 그때로부터 근 200년을 인간의 피로 비대해진 미제의 살인 만행은 북반부를 일시 강점했던 기간에 극도에 이르렀습니다. 과한 살인마인 US a s Army Commander Walker ordered his soldiers. 유엔군 병사들이요. 설사 그대들 앞에 Soldiers of the UN forces never hesitate to kill Koreans even though they are children or elderly. Kill them. By so doing, you can save yourself from ruin and honor your responsibility as members of the UN forces. 이제가 일시 강점한 The whole land of northern half of Korea was dyed deep in blood shed by Koreans during the temporary U.S. occupation. Here is a photograph discovered in the dead body of a U.S. soldier. On the back of it, he wrote, I can't sleep without killing anyone. Kill them. The U.S.-led bloodbath had already begun in Korea from the first days of its troops setting steps in South Korea in September 1945. They had killed some 93,000 men, women and children in the most brutal manner for nearly four years until July 1949. In May 1951, a fact-finding team came to the Democratic People's Republic of Korea from the International Women's Union. Its members visited Pyongyang, Pyeongchon, Anak, Nampo, Kaecheon, Wonsan, and Muncheon to see with their own eyes the very spot in which the U.S. troops massacred hundreds of thousands of Koreans in the most cruel manners that human beings can hardly imagine. They were from 17 countries including Canada, Great Britain, France, Italy, former West Germany, and Belgium. They had different nationalities, political views, and ideologies. But they were unanimous in saying. The U.S. troops are now committing a merciless and planned massacre against Koreans. All atrocities were committed by hands of U.S. soldiers or officers or by the orders from U.S. commanders. These mass killings and mass torture are severer in intensity than the crimes committed by Nazis in Europe. There were no bounds in Yankee's atrocities. They disemboweled pregnant women and cut small children into pieces by further choppers and threw them into wells. They pierced wires into noses and ears to draw them along before killing them. They bound a woman to that tree and burnt her to death. They tore human limbs by driving ox carts to opposite sides, saw heads and drove nails through skulls.
Kim Chun Chun, a girl who could have a narrow escape in Sinchon when her whole family members were slaughtered, said. That day, all of my 17 family members were killed. The U.S. troops axed her grandfather's head, slashed the breasts of grandmother and mother, gouged out the eyes of a younger brother, and cut his throat. Six hundred and fifty people were buried alive in a trench near the bomb shelter of the Simpson County Committee of the Workers' Party of Korea. At the bomb shelter of the Workers' Party of Korea Simpson County Committee, gasoline was burned to kill 900 and at another dugout of the county security office, they closed the old doors and exploded dynamite to blast out 520 people. They committed a massacre, a genocide of all Koreans, which did not spare young and old men and women. Numerous people were killed and thrown into the reservoirs and lakes and rivers, including South Reservoir in Simpson County. Over 4,000 civilians were thrown into the river Taedong by the U.S. troops. Here are the two gunpowder magazines in Wonami, Simpson County, in which 102 children and 400 mothers were burned to death. A series of serious defeat in the Korean War had driven the United States to the tables of ceasefire talks. But behind the scene of talks, Yankees revealed their true colors as human barges, violently infringing upon the widely accepted norms and the regulations of the international laws. They committed germ warfare as another attempt to exterminate the Korean people. Chairman Bradley of the Joint Chiefs of Staff gave instructions in October 1951 on the use of germ weapons as dictated by U.S. President Truman. A variety of objects infected by typhoid, cholera, pest, and other infectious viruses were thrown over northern half of Korea as well as germ bombs. The U.S. bombers dropped germ bombs 400 times on 70-odd areas within only two months between January the 28th and March the 25th, 1952. An investigation team also came to Pyongyang from the International Democratic Lawyers Association in March 1952. The team members, after fact-finding tours, said, the incident occurring in Korea is not a war, but a crime. It is criminal in its planning, criminal in its start, and also criminal in its practice, we declare. U.S. prisoners of war, former U.S. pilots who had practiced germ warfare, confessed. Hitler and Nazis never used germ bombs, but I served the warmongers of Wall Street 
by dropping them on the Korean territory. The criminal acts of the U.S. troops enraged the world public as they aimed to massacre all of Koreans even by utilizing pest and cholera and to bring misfortune to humanity. Voices accusing the United States of the criminal acts and atrocities of its troops in Korea were heard in Asia, Europe and throughout the world. History will always remember all these crimes the U.S. troops had committed in Korea and severely punish them for what they had done. In the spring of 1969, American B-52s had begun the secret bombing of neutral Cambodia. These top-secret military cables, obtained under the Freedom of Information Act, were part of a cover-up that was the real beginning of Watergate. The pilots were sworn not to tell even their superiors, and their logs were falsified. The official aim of the bombing was to wipe out a Viet Cong base in Cambodia, a base that existed only in the imagination of American generals. President Nixon's aim was to show the Vietnamese communists just how tough he could be, a policy he once described as the madman theory of war. The Cambodians who died were called collateral damage, and their burning villages were called friendly fire. The Pentagon had described Cambodians as a docile and passive people who cannot be relied upon to act in a positive way for the benefit of American policies. In 1970, the United States invaded Cambodia. A member of Dr. Kissinger's staff described how the invasion was launched. Nixon had been watching his favorite movie, Patton, whose war heroics seemed to fortify his toughness. Kissinger had been dining out on stories of Nixon's drinking. Shortly before the invasion, Nixon, who was drunk, spoke to Kissinger on the phone. He slurred, if this doesn't work, it'll be your ass, Henry. Kissinger had once described Nixon as unfit to be president. He also called him a meatball mind. Between the two of them, they began the destruction of those passive, docile people, thousands of miles away here in Cambodia. Of course, Nixon was later apprehended, not for the murder of Cambodia, but for a domestic affair called Watergate. Kissinger received the Nobel Peace Prize. Out of the inferno of bombs came Pol Pot, a former Buddhist monk, and the Khmer Rouge, whose revolution had never enjoyed a popular base until Nixon's madman theory of war. The bombing upset the delicate balance of royalists, republicans, and communists. It triggered a war that caused at least a million dead and wounded, and tore apart the very fabric of Cambodia. Preserve peace with honor, Nixon and Kissinger decided to defend the anti-communist regime in Cambodia. It was to be a secret mission, airstrikes against communist forces directed by the American embassy in Phnom Penh. It made free the American um, Air Force. They could not bomb in Laos, they could not bomb in Vietnam, so that began the, the incredible bombing of Cambodia. And this is when the number of bombs dropped equaled the, the amount of bombs dropped on Japan during World War II. Elizabeth Becker covered the war in Cambodia from 1972 to 1974. We would be able to hear um, the conversation between the pilot, the American pilot in the air, and the American embassy, which was illegally directing the airstrikes. We couldn't understand why there were so many civilian casualties in this war. Why were they hitting all these civilians and villages? It was you know, every nightmare of how you fight a war. From 1969 to 1973, more than 500,000 Cambodians died. 
By 1974, the bombing had disrupted the nation's agricultural system and a famine ensued. Over two million refugees poured into overcrowded cities. American policy in those years towards Cambodia helped create the conditions, perhaps the only conditions, in which the Khmer Rouge came to power. The Khmer Rouge drew strength from the chaos of the country. When they seized power in 1975, they forced populations of entire cities back to the countryside. Then they began a policy of exterminating their enemies in execution grounds that came to be known as killing fields. By 1979, another three million Cambodians had lost their lives. That is totally incorrect. I think we inherited a tragedy. We attempted to and succeeded in extricating America with honor from this tragedy. Oh, we inherited it. No, you did not inherit it. You created, you were the designers of the Cambodian policy.
，观众朋友，我现在是在巴格达市中心的这个。And so um, the bombing of, of civilians uh, has become just the norm. Uh, so you, you also notice not only um, scenes from the actual Guernica, the place, but also um, pictures from Picasso's Guernica and also uh, scenes from shock and awe, the campaign, shock and awe, uh, to, to uh, exemplify um, the the, uh, the casual bombing of civilian targets. <laughs>
amazing thing. Dave Cartwright comes to me and says, you know, I need some music to a uh, movie I'm making. And I say to myself, well, what, what's it about? He goes, uh, war. And I go, I, I can't believe that. Dave Cartwright making a video about war. How could this be? It's a, you know, who would guess this thing? And then I go, you know, I was making uh, part two of the centrifugal Zotz clock. And, you know, what's it about? Well, part two is about war. So I go, well, what a confluence of events. So I go, okay, that's a, that's a good deal. And so we start out with a number of different pieces, and we arrive at Nexus of Debris. And this is a piece that starts out sort of, you know, the stale, dead time between events where soldiers catch up on sleep and has a hollow emptiness where they're just getting away from the terrible miasma that they're stuck in of war. And then it sort of picks up tempo and it sort of uh, it gets more like the soldiers coming to sharp focus because he's getting ready for battle. The battle's ready to come. And then it leads to the chaos of the actual war, with splinters flying everywhere and shrapnel and everything. And they are at the nexus of debris. Well, then comes the rule of three. The thing about the rule of three is <clears throat> the uh, Discordian people have something about five, and they make up a Dadaistic. Uh, absurd world built around five lots of good jokes a little cthulhu thrown in and you know but i said to myself i have to come up with something more absurd not more absurd but at least close to as absurd as war and five's not going to cut it i had to come up with my own and so I, I said three three is the thing now the thing is is most great things come in threes for instance you know life liberty the pursuit of happiness, and to the French, liberty, equality, and egalitarianism. Now, I could list more of them. You know, I say to myself, "All right, what, you know, what do the scientists say?" The scientists say that we have trouble remembering numbers larger than seven or to nine. Okay, that's that's a lot of numbers. You try to try to remember eleven, you get out there. I can't remember that. So phone numbers are only seven. And, and they're seven for a reason. Not only that that's the limits of memory. By the way, three is much easier to remember than seven or nine. You know, that makes three definitely superior. And three dominates nine as it's its square root. So it can't, nine is ashamed even to compete with three. I told you, see, three is the all-encompassing thing. And three is, once again much easier to remember by far and the last but not least don't fight three and its related buddies you know if you take on and, and go you know and fight with one three seven and nine well you know you the odds are against you okay well you know as absurd as all that may be What's, what's more absurd than Alexander marching his army and sort of a, uh, a culling process out in the desert, killing a bunch of them senselessly in the age where, you know, spears, swords, hatchets, and if you're storming the castle, molten metal gets poured all over you. This is, this is ter terrible, terrible stuff, you know. And, and so what's the, what's, what's the point of it? It's just unbelievably stupid. And, you know, and you, you enter into the age of bullets, and you would think that with that superior firepower, then people go, well, that makes even less sense. And yet there it is, some guy in his pajamas, his wool pajamas, walking a field, maybe one to two football fields in length, <clears throat> as cannonball <clears throat> explodes around him in shrapnel, and these people behind earthworks are, are, are firing into him. Well, how, how crazy you only get one life you just get one life and that this is your plan this is the best plan now to add insult to injury you're walking towards these 
people that are shooting at you to do what? You, you, you're, you're, you're going through this for slavery? For slavery? Are you kidding me? That's insane. You mean, you, 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 your enemy isn't the, the guys in the earthworks. You, you need to go shoot the plantation owner, you know? To the one that loves slavery. Then in the north, you know, some industrialists are sending their guys through. It's not as bad. It's nowhere near as bad as people doing that over slavery, which is utterly ridiculous. But you know, they're going there. They're saying we can't let these people secede. But I think when they formed that union, that secession was p part of the game. That, that that everybody that did it knew that well, if you wanted to leave, you could leave. Then suddenly, no, the trap door shuts. And these other people have to take shrapnel in the forehead for so something that was not baked into the cake. But again, nowhere near as bad as the ones doing it for slavery. But it's, it's insane, you know. You know, maybe it's even stupider than uh, following Alexander around in the desert because you really don't have any choice. He's got the food. But the thing is, the British colonists, they went across the ocean, okay, they went across the ocean, and what was that for? Well, so that the king and his big muckety mucks could collect taxes, you know, could collect these, this, you know, they're all going over there and getting shot at in the woods and stuff over something that doesn't help them a bit so that, you know, their rulers can ha get more taxes. And you'd think, you know, so... Uh, Maybe they'll wake up, we, but then Woodrow Wilson comes along. It's World War I, and Woodrow Wilson, of course, creates the Federal Reserve. A brilliant man. At least, you know, he had the uh, common sense to, at the, towards the end of his life, to say that was one of his worst mistake ever, and who are we to argue with him? Yeah, the cent, you know, central banks who did what? Well, you know, the participants in World War I, as they were maiming people by the hundreds of thousands, and the Zom and the uh, Verdun, you know, Passchendaele, and all these these horror th zones where just, what was the point? Everybody's, you know, running in for the ego of the militarists in the country, the, me the ego of the leaders. Everybody, yeah, you had complete... Um, prosperity in World War One, but we've said that before. And so Woodrow Wilson, you know, who's who's been bungling everything up, up until then, get, he's fighting in Mexico, and he's, uh, you know, t going, picking one set of allies and switching off and go to another, and, you know, it's, it's completely ridiculous. It's like a Laurel and Hardy show. But Woodrow Wilson needs to get in this World War One, even though when he ran for office, you know, he ran saying, well, you need to elect me because I'll keep you out of these European wars. And what does he do? For the sake of his ego, he's got to get into that war. And, eh, again, tens of thousands of Americans die for that. Just like Henry VIII, who at the end of his illustrious career of chopping women's heads off and just doing every rotten thing, Somehow, in his mind, he thinks he's going to be forgotten. He's thinking, well, you know, I've got to do this because I might be forgotten. Just like Wilson. They, 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 we need history to remember me. And in both cases, they had done enough rotten stuff. Woodrow Wilson had, uh, you know, had uh, racial uh, restrictions on hiring for federal jobs. You know, I mean, he's, this guy, he, they both really didn't need it. And so everybody was dying for no good reason, you know. And, you know, all the way up till, you know, the Germans in Stalingrad are dying for the egos of their ridiculous leaders who built, uh, you know, models of buildings they were going to build. And they, they looked at them say, to see, if, well, I think this will look really good when it's in, in ruins because they're thinking about, the Greek culture and the ancient Greeks and so forth and caught up in Napoleonic nonsense and they're just just you know just pure dumb ego they're, you know people by the million are getting killed for these really bad reasons 
and and you know uh, it's incredible and so you know what can you say war is really stupid civilian casualties as we are going to describe them are going to be purposefully and unapologetically uncomfortable and a challenge to some of the prevailing narratives that you hear about smart munitions or proportionality or distinction on the battlefield and we're going to talk about the global war on terror, but I'm going to begin by the war immediately preceding that that the U.S. was involved in, in Kosovo. The United Nations commissioned a panel to look at this war and the NATO airstrikes to determine if any of them were unlawful. And remember I said I'd like to start with legal frameworks. So consider these, the applicable law, the legal issues related target selection, that combat military commanders are required, the UN's final report said, to direct their operations against military objectives when directing their operations to ensure that the losses to the civilian population and to damage to civilian property are not disproportionate to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated, attacks which are not directed against military objectives and attacks which cause disproportionate civilian casualties or civilian property may be unlawful. Commanders deciding on an attack have duties to do everything practicable to verify that the objectives to be attacked are military objectives, to take all practical precautions in the choice of methods and means of warfare with a view to avoiding or in any event minimizing incidental civilian casualties, and to refrain from launching attacks which may be expected to cause disproportionate civilian casualties. The practical application is effectively capsulated in Article 57, which says commanders must do everything feasible to verify that the objectives to be attacked are neither civilians nor civilian objects. The Pentagon announced, and it was encapsulated very well in a story in the Washington Post, that it had launched a major examination of civilian deaths in military operations, responding to criticism that it had failed to protect innocent bystanders in counterterrorism wars worldwide. The far-reaching initi initiative to create the military's first ever policy on civilian casualties, which senior Pentagon officials began last year, seeks to answer a central question. Why is the military's estimate of civilian deaths so much smaller than that of outside tallies? Last week, the Pentagon reported that 1,190 civilians had been killed by American strikes in Iraq and Syria since the beginning of the campaign against the Islamic State in 2014. Respected Monitoring Group put the figure at at least 7,478, more than six times as high. But profoundly missing in this report, even though there are some really interesting recommendations, is a view from the ground. And what you see here is a big departure from wars of the past, when the United States and other militaries would bomb entire cities, right? You see a level of precision. And this is what military officials, when they're describing, you know, a so-called precision strike, often talk about, is that kind of precision. But sometimes what's missing is the knowledge that even if you hit a target that you intend to hit exactly the way you want to hit it, it may not be the right thing. And you won't know that sometimes unless you go to the ground. So I just want to show you what that aerial view doesn't show you, which is two family homes struck in what looked like the perfect hit. It killed several people, including a woman, uh, a, a wife of a man named Boston Razo, uh, their daughter, a nephew, and a brother-in-law were all killed in this particular strike. And I, I raise this example just to show you that what might look perfect may not be. And until you go to the ground and you try to investigate that, it's very hard to understand what the real, true human costs of war are. So if you read through this report, what you won't see is discussion of going to the ground and doing these investigations. But I want to take you through a study that I did uh, with a sociologist for the New York Times Magazine in which we designed a cluster sample of 103 airstrikes in three parts of Iraq that had been previously taken over by ISIS. And in each of these places I went door to door, casing 
which airstrikes had happened in these neighborhoods, whom they had hit. In addition to digging through rubble and interviewing hundreds of survivors, I found informants who passed on intelligence for these airstrikes. I analyzed satellite imagery. I reached out to experts who deal with arms and tried to identify weapons. Uh, and I also went to the U.S. Air Base in Qatar, where that air war is largely directed from, the air war against ISIS. And ultimately, I provided all of these coordinates to the U.S. in an effort to try to understand what had happened, you know, which were uh, conducted by the U.S. military uh, or the U.S.-led coalition, uh, what they believed had happened when it comes to civilian death, and what I had found on the ground. And just to give you a sense, if you look at the coalition's available data, about one in 157 strikes in Iraq resulted in a civilian death during Operation Inherent Resolve. On the ground, in this cluster sample, we found that one in five killed a civilian, a rate that's 31 times higher. So that raises a fundamental question about what the US military really knows about the civilians it's harming. And so when you read that 35-page report, Tell me what you read about being on the ground. The recommendations are interesting. They raise fascinating questions about payments that need to be made, but what they don't deal with is what we found constantly, which is that in about half of the civilian casualty incidents that were found, there was a problem of intelligence. They thought they were hitting ISIS. They actually hit civilians. And this happens often, where in the wake of criticism, the military will commission a study. Now, a study like this hasn't been done before. But if you look at last year's uh, defense spending bill, Congress mandated for the first time that an official now be tasked with setting these policies. And a large part of that was a result of this reporting. And so I just wanted to take a moment to center some of the people and the stories that you won't read about in these technical reports some of their losses and what it truly means when we shift the cost of war to foreign populations, right? When we have fewer American civilians dying and fewer American soldiers dying when we shift to an air war and less of an American public that's familiar with the fact that we're even at war because we're deploying fewer troops. And as a result, what does it mean about who's paying the costs of the wars that we wage? I just add one thing that in the military, and I use plural because it includes multiple coalitions and the alliance NATO as well as the United States, has sometimes set standards where it's impossible for them to acknowledge a civilian casualty. Libya is a good example where they went around after the Libyan campaign and said repeatedly, we have no zero confirmed civilian casualties from the air campaign in Libya, which did cause civilian casualties. Not an extraordinarily high amount, but we were able to document at least 70 of them without a great deal of effort, with about two months of reporting, right down to death certificates and retrieving the remnants of the ordinance from the strike sites. So you ask them, what's the definition of a confirmed civilian casualty? And they say, well, that's a casualty that we've investigated. And you say, well, how many have you investigated? Well, zero. How many do you plan to investigate? Well. Zero. So in other words, they've created a tautology in a circular logic that always stays at zero. And that's what investigators sometimes come up against, even when you're at the strike site, holding the traceable piece of ordinance and looking at blood on the walls.
everyone understands the notion of war with two armies meeting in a battlefield and oh, and and uh, going head to head in the ultimate of violence. But war is really conducted at all sorts of different levels, more subtle levels. So you have and so you have different levels of war, when, even to the lightest level. So for instance. If uh, they're making a, they make a requirement that every yard has to have purple roses, has to grow purple roses, six of them, or they will be violating a statute, and then they will be, the person not growing the flowers will be subject to a fine, $100 or $200 fine, who knows, any amount, okay, that is a form of war all of the different statutory events where you know occupational licensing and so forth where you where basically like you might want to uh, you know wash hair but then they say you no, you need you need a license to do that and you have to have uh, you know 200 hours of uh, university training and hair washing which is all ridiculous it's uh, of course, the function is a crony function. It's one in which, uh, you know, it helps the people doing that collect money. The people who are in that occupation it, enjoy the fact that there's barriers to the entry for, for others. All these things are forms of war. All these things, every time where people interfere pe with people, okay, anything involving a victimless crime is a form of war. Uh, when 9-11 happened, nothing shocked me as much. Uh, I saw a whole of America basically giving up on freedom. I saw a police state arise so fast that it stunned me. As a libertarian, I had spent about three decades of my life fighting for freedom, and all of a sudden it seemed to collapse at one moment. And I thought, have I wasted my life? And one of the things I asked myself was the same thing Henry David Thoreau asked himself when the state came knocking on his door to pay the poll tax. What is my relation to the state? I stopped being, I had two attitudes toward, toward the state. One was uh, to rail against it, to, to do, I've, I've been told that there is an Italian saying that if translated in English is, it's rainy again, pig of a government, which is uh, to, to basically just rail against state. The other one, which Henry David Thoreau expressed, is to, when he was released from jail and went out on, on his own, on a hill, he basically looked around and saw the beauty of the world and said, "Here, inside myself, there is no state." But what uh, I, you know, I think that's great, and I think Thoreau. Uh, it's interesting. I feel like he's he's his purchase on the American psyche has been fading, and that's a real problem. Uh, because he refused to live in the world that other people tried to build for him or the prisons that it built for him. But what do you say with something, you know, if there is a growing uh, uh, abuse of civil liberties and police power, what is the role of political activism to combat that? I mean, do we get into a place where we're going to ignore the state even as they're putting us away? I don't say ignore the state. I am going to cry out against the state. I, I rail against it constantly. I, I, I speak out, I protest, and I think that's common decency. The state is knocking on my door, it's knocking on your door, there is a police state. However, I think in terms, I want to live freedom. I just don't want to rail against it. And I'm starting to very creatively pursue things like alternative currencies, I'm trying to, to uh, go into barter, I'm trying to go into agorism, every way I can to avoid the state. Because most of all, Thoreau said we should get on with the business of living. I do not want the state to be so important in my life that I forget to live. We want to be free. The state is there, it's going to be a police state, it's going to come down hard on all of us. We need community. For nearly half a century, America has waged a war on crime. A new all-out offensive. The explosion of violent crime. Three strikes and you are out. But to lock up all those criminals, you need prisons. After decades of tough laws and stiff sentences, America's prisons are bursting at the seams. Every day we serve our communities, 
From small towns to large cities at more than 60 locations across our country, we play an important role in public safety. Since 1983, we've partnered with governments to provide innovative correctional services. As the nation's fifth largest correctional system, we build, own, and manage secure correctional facilities for federal agencies, nearly half of all states and local governments. With the backing of 17,000 employees, we combine the accountability of government with the efficiency of business. Governments partner with us to relieve their detention overcrowding and bring cost efficiencies. As our correction services save taxpayer dollars, governments can then focus on other public needs like hospitals, schools, parks, and roads. At the end of every day, we know that our work is making a difference. We are America's leader in partnership corrections. We are CCA. The fact that we spend over $80 billion a year in incarcerating people, oftentimes who've only been engaged in nonviolent drug offenses. One in four black males born today can expect to spend time in prison. In an exclusive interview, a former warden and a former inmate tell us death is easier than life at the federal supermax. Even if the behaviors are good, though, it's pretty much a 23 hour a day in the cell, one hour outside. And even outside, it's not uh, a walk in the park. It's a, a caged environment. A prisoner lives in a cell the size of a bathroom. It has a shower, a toilet, a concrete slab covered with a thin mattress. In the rare time outside, prisoners are kept in cages. One 15-minute phone call per month and a small black and white TV may seem like luxuries. But Hood says they're also tools, so the guards have something to take away. People who've been here say the best hope an inmate has is to be sent somewhere else. But what we also know is this huge spike in incarcerations is also driven by nonviolent drug offenses uh, where the sentencing is completely out of proportion with the crime. In America, we now spend nearly $200 billion on public safety, including $70 billion a year on correctional facilities. Uh, the United States accounts for 5% of the world's population. We account for 25% uh, of the world's inmates.
savior, one who has a great influence here at the Archipelago. Good evening, my fellow Americans. First, I should like to express my gratitude to the radio and television networks for the opportunities they have given me over the years to bring reports and messages to our nation. This evening, I come to you with a message of leave taking and farewell, and to share a few final thoughts with you, my countrymen. A vital element in keeping the peace is our military establishment. Our arms must be mighty, ready for instant action, so that no potential aggressor may be tempted to risk his own destruction. Our military organization today bears little relation to that known of any of my predecessors in peacetime, or indeed by the fighting men of World War II or Korea. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Added to this, three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporations. Now, this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together.
Sudasu, 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 Sudasu.